A new report by the International Labour Organization has chronicled the impact, the brutal impact for many and the profits for some from the practice of forced labour. According to the report, forced labour in the private economy generates US dollars 236 billion in illegal profits per year. This is a dramatic rise from 10 years ago and reveals the need for more decisive action on the issue. We go to Abdul for the details of the report. You maybe take us through what are some of the salient aspects and then we can go on to what are the possibilities for addressing the crisis. Well, Prashant, the International Labour Organization has prepared a report basically which talks about how uh, forced labour ha has been used by the corporate houses primarily uh, to earn a massive illegal uh, profit. Uh, according to its finding, every year around 230 plus billion dollars of profits, illegal profits are made by the private players uh, through forced labour, forced labour, which is very similar to what it is called uh, slavery and uh, Ayala calls it modern day slavery. It says that how the number of people who were forced, who are forced to uh, do work uh, for the profit of certain uh, uh, corporate houses has increased uh, since the last uh, uh, study which was conducted in 2014 and says that uh, uh, between 2016 and 2021, Within these uh, five years, the number increased by 2.7 million. So overall, 20 around 28 million people out of uh, 1,000 every three and three and a half individuals are forced to do, uh, uh, forced to work for someone else's profit. Uh, it, it talks about how in this period also the per capita profit from the forced labor has also increased from eight thousand uh, uh, dollars to uh, around ten thousand plus uh, dollars, and that means that there is a very uh, massive exploitation which is happening to uh, the victims of forced labor. Who are these people who are basically uh, forced to do work for someone else? These are primarily people who are trafficked uh, across the borders. These are the people who are desperate, who are who are des in desperation, moving from one country to another. Most of them are migrants, but also other people who are basically used by the uh, 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 through the use of criminals and other uh, elements uh, used uh, by the uh, co private corporate houses to basically uh, work almost for free. Uh, uh, so uh, that is one of it, the basic part of this report says that a majority of that profit uh, comes through the. Uh, uh, sexual labor, exploitation of sex, uh, basically women uh, through sexual uh, uh, in uh, uh, forced sexual labor, and that basically has con that contributes around one hundred seventy plus million, uh, sorry, billion dollars every year. So that shows that the majority of this comes through the sexual uh, exploitation, uh, sex trafficking, and so on and so forth. But a large part also comes from. Uh, forced labor in industries and in other economic sectors. So in this context, what are the kind of measures that the uh, world could take to actually address them? What does the report say on that? Well, uh, the report is primarily talking about uh, uh, how uh, this kind of labor uh, is basically, of course, it uh, completely dismantles uh, human dignity. Uh, this kind of labor is uh, uh, is similar to slavery, and therefore there are already uh, very strong laws made by uh, not only uh, the individual countries but also internationally, which basically illegalizes uh, uh, all of these kind of practices. So the ILO talks about a better implementation of the existing laws by the individual countries to be uh, kind of. Uh, a, and this kind of forced uh, labor, which is similar to slavery. But it also talks about how there is a need of uh, end of ending the conflicts. There is a need of uh, curbing uh, all kind of human trafficking in whatever way possible. And uh, a crackdown on those all those uh, uh, illegal activities, which ultimately uh, uses the vulnerabilities of the people uh, in different ways, uh, which would mean that there, there should be a better coordination uh, among nations when it comes to curbing the international racket of human trafficking. It also would mean, of course, that there should be a massive crackdown on all those agencies and private players who basically see 
uh, human vulnerability as a possibility of exploitation and uh, in order to earn uh, maximum profits. So uh, curbing the greed of the corporate houses is, is one way of, uh, and, and that would mean, of course, that there is in there are some examples of collaboration between the corporate houses and the state officials in several countries that also needs to be checked and controlled. So these are some of the recommendations which are all well known, uh, which needs to be um, uh, implemented in order to uh, control the forced labor, the rising uh, 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 profitability of the illegal uh, slave kind of slave trade and and that should can only be done with the uh, greater proactivity on behalf of the states involved and of course on behalf of the international organizations thank you so much abdul for the update in less than 3 weeks the fifth people sorry, in less than 3 weeks the fifth people's health assembly will begin in argentina the pha is one of the biggest congregations of health activists in the world and is taking place at a time when the covid-19 pandemic laid out the stark structural issues in the field of healthcare for activists who are at the forefront of fighting these structural issues the pha is a space to analyze them plan strategies and seek to mobilize more people in the fight for what they call health for all we go to anna to hear more about the issue Anna, thank you so much for joining us. So, very important uh, event coming up uh, in the first week of April. That's the Fifth People's Health Assembly. Uh, the last one was in 2018 in uh, Bangladesh and a lot of discussions also taking place in the run-up to it. So, maybe could you tell us a bit first about the PHA itself? Why is it significant? A bit about its history maybe as well. The People's Health Assembly is one of the main events that uh, the People's Health Movement does uh, every couple of years in order to bring different struggles together and essentially to bring all those uh, health activists who have been fighting uh, for universal access to healthcare against the uh, against the impact of uh, of uh, big transnational companies on health but also uh, those activists who have been campaigning on issues related to food and uh, and gender uh, and migration and health to bring them all in one place and to facilitate the exchange uh, and just to kind of bring inspiration to, to, to the struggles moving forward. So as you said, this is the fifth assembly that we're doing. It's the second one that's taking place in Latin America. The last one was in Ecuador in, 2000, uh, in 2005. Uh, so of course, you know, this one is quite specific, of course, because uh, it's the first one that's taking place after the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we're not running away from the fact that that is something that has marked uh, the landscape of global health uh, and through that also the people's health movement uh, a great deal. Uh, but we're also hopeful that, you know, uh, as we come again to, to Latin America, we'll be able to essentially look back uh, and uh, make concrete plans uh, when it comes to the things that we can do and that the things that uh, we have done over the past uh, five years can be used uh, and uh, in order to to bring us forward towards health for all, as was uh, the intention of the people's health movement from the very beginning. Right, Anna. So in this context, you already mentioned COVID nineteen, but what are the kind of broad themes which are likely to be discussed during the People's Health Assembly? Well, we're um, it's very broad, <laughs> if we can put it that way. Uh, but essentially, uh, it is uh, a very difficult task. Uh, you know. A lot can happen in five years, a lot did happen in the past five years. Uh, and because we're not able to meet every as often uh, as we would like, uh, of course, the People's Health Assembly is the space where we try to fit as many discussions as we can. So uh, this year, uh, actually in a couple of weeks, we'll be talking uh, about uh, how health systems have been impacted by this latest round of austerity of privatization. Uh, what were the what was the resistance mounted to, to those trends, both by health activists and by health workers? Uh, of course, we'll also be talking about the impacts uh, and the interrelations of gender justice and health, because we did see over the past uh, past years uh, big changes in both directions when it comes to uh, to women's rights in health. Uh, particularly when it comes to, to reproductive and sexual health rights, of course, but also uh, also uh, many other uh, many other health services that belong that could fall under this category. Um, one of the key and crucial issues, of course, is the issue of the war on Palestine, the war on Gaza, 
uh, one of the things that the assembly will uh, will strive to do is to show that uh, the people of the world and the health activists of the world sh uh, stand in solidarity with the people of Gaza and with the health workers who continue to to work, although um, the, the attacks continue. Uh, and then, in addition to that, we'll also be uh, trying to bring in and to reinforce the focus on some of the topics uh, that health movements in Latin America have been proposing for a very long time. That includes uh, ancestral knowledge and uh, the concepts uh, concepts like when we live. Uh, and then, of course, we're also going to talk about uh, food systems and the impacts of the current food systems and well, more broadly, maybe even commercial determinants uh, on uh, on human and planetary health. And of course, the uh, uh, event taking place, the uh, meeting taking place in a very strategic location, that's uh, Argentina, where, uh, you know, which has really been at the center of uh, some many of the issues you've been talking about. So what is the significance there and what are the kind of expectations over there? Well, uh, I think it would be fair to say that uh, when we started to plan uh, the, uh, this assembly, we did know that uh, it would have a particular strength if it was to be held in, in Latin America. And luckily, there were many, many comrades in Latin America who were willing to put all this effort into organizing an assembly. Uh, to be fair, we did not know at the time that Argentina would be coming, going through this kind of political moment uh, when the assembly was to be held. But of course, uh, this only means that uh, you know the presence of PHM becomes more and more important, and the solidarity expands now also to our comrades in Argentina, uh, who have really done a tremendous effort to keep this debate about health uh, and the importance of uh, solidarity in health alive. Uh, although we do know that they're they're going through very difficult moments at the time. So this this time the People's Health Assembly. Uh, as well, it was every single time until now. I think it's also fair to say it's also a statement of solidarity towards the the PHM circle who is hosting it. Thank you so much, Anna, for those updates. And that's all we have in today's daily debrief. We'll be back with a fresh episode tomorrow. In the meanwhile, do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Follow us on all the social media platforms. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button.